construction of uh, the models of coalescing binary system that have been used extensively so far. Uh, doing so, he established a whole new chapter in general relativity, gathering many beautiful minds in the field, including Luc Blanchet, Bangalore, Satya Pakash, Gerd Schaffer, Balair, Piotr Jaranowski, and others. As an avid reader of Thibault's papers, I was always impressed and delighted by the measure and elegance of his arguments in the traditions of the noblest French mathematics, from Galois to Poincaré, Hadamar, Borel, Schwarz, and so on. Oh, and those of physicists. <laughs> those of physicists. <laughs> Professor Lamour has interacted with many Italian scientists, including Gabriele Veneziano and Remo Ruffini, who early recognized his uncommon talent, and many Italian students and collaborators, including Alessandra Bonanno, now, now director of MPI AEI, who collaborated with him in the development of the effective one-body approach to compact binary mergers, Alessandro Nagar, and more recently Donato Bini, Andrea Geralico, and others. Among several honors, he has been recently awarded by the Galileo Galilei Medal from INFN for the fundamental understanding of source of gravitational radiation. So thanks again to Professor Damour for accepting uh, our invitation. Our I want to add also that uh, Thibault is a, a SIGGRAPH medalist, so please. <laughs> He's also a SIGGRAPH medalist, and, and uh, uh, I hope that Thibault will forgive us for these inconveniences related to the internet and his mysteries, but internet is definitely more complicated than general relativity, <laughs> so we have, to, <laughs> we have to cope with that. Okay, enjoy your okay. lecture. So what should I do now? Because I did not. Ah, interesting. <laughs> you should share your screen, Thibault. I think that's share your screen. Yes. But where is the share screen button here? Uh, top right. It's the the rectangle, the white rectangle with an arrow. With an arrow. Top right. Uh, yes. There is an arrow. I'll open uh, share tray. We'll upward. Open share tray. And then. Open share tray. Yeah. Exactly. On the screen, on the screen. On the screen. Ah, but now everything. Perfect, perfect. Perfect. Okay, you see yeah, yeah. But yeah, now yeah. Let me open because I closed my computer to solve the problem. So, uh, okay. So the conferences are here. Naples. Oops. Uh, So it should open now, just a moment. Yes, it opens. So I review, um, I play slideshow. So do you uh, see? No, we are not No, no, seeing. no, wait, wait, wait. I think that you have again to, uh, to share your screen because if the ah. file was not on screen, then probably it is stuck on the previous window. So yeah, uh, also when you, when you share your screen, it gives you an option to share either the whole screen or a specific window, yeah. and you should click on the whole screen. Okay, but now show device setting, enter full yeah. screen, no. Exactly. Not yet share screen, raise hand. No, I, I, think, I think you should stop sharing and then reshare. And then, re and then restart, yeah. Stop sharing, okay. Open share tray. By the way, it does not say screen sharing, it says open share tray. Ah, but now I can choose this probably. Do you see? Okay, oh, perfect, yeah, perfect. Do you see it? So yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. I, uh, I play slideshow. Yeah, yeah. It's okay now, full screen? Yes, uh, no, it's yeah, not yeah. yet full screen, but but okay. we can see the, the content, so. The content. I cannot do bigger on my screen, it's full. Ah, I should have shared screen with the full screen first. Okay, um, try, maybe, try. maybe, maybe, yeah, please. Okay, so I, okay, I understand. So I have to, okay, so I have to play slideshow and, ah, but now, yes, but then he, I cannot see uh, the page of Teams to share screen. If I stop sharing, open share tray, it will not, 
it still it will open only sorry uh, you, you, okay because but this thing is not full screen if yeah. i do but it's not presentation this one it is uh, this is the big on my screen it's full now can you uh. see? Thibault, let's do like this. I think that uh, uh, if I go probe, to the next page, do you see it? Yes. Uh, oh. We are we are still on the title page. Yes. Now next page. No. 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 Maybe maybe the professor can avoid uh, putting slideshow and just present in this uh, in the window, uh, which is not full screen. Right. Well, now we see the page moving. Oh, but now it's small. Yes. Can I make it bigger? Ah, how do I avoid the side things? View. Uh, okay, side view, view. Side only. It's better, maybe. Okay, okay. Yeah. How do I forget about the right part? No, it will not. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, it's fine. I think it's it's, it's not fine. Yeah, it's, fine. it's not it's not full size, but we can see what is written in it. So. I can try to ah maybe uh, one hundred percent. Ah no, but it's it's just no, no. it's no. Uh, no. Now it's bigger. It's smaller. Okay. 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 It's good. Thibault, on on the top left of your uh, um, panel, you have this view. Yes. And maybe if you change something there, what happens? Uh, so there is navigator slide only. This is what I have chosen. Light table, outline, edit master slides. Oh, okay, okay. So it's bad. It's, it doesn't it doesn't affect the size of the image on the screen. Okay. I would like to see this thing. No. I'm okay. I'm afraid to deal with this. Okay. We never that, start. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. That's good. That's good. So. So, so let me. So I want to guide you through the theoretical path, going from. Do you see my mouse, by the way? Going from the motion of two compact objects, two neutron stars or two black holes orbiting around each other somewhere in the universe, emitting gravitational waves, and how the gravitational wave signal. Uh, detected by the two LIGO observatories and uh, Virgo, allowed to extract physical parameters from the, the gravitational wave signal, like for the first event, the two masses, the effective spin, and the distance. Oh, la, now, uh, now it does not want to go to the next slide, uh, because Okay, now why? Maybe this. Now, if I don't show uh, share, it does not want to go to the next slide now. I need navigator. Yes. Yes. Sorry. This is a mess, but that's it. Can you still see the screen more or less? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we see, we see. LIGO raw data, yes. Okay. Yes. So, so the first point I, I want to emphasize is the interferometric detectors. And you heard a very elegant uh, conference by uh, Ray Weiss uh, on it. Uh, this marvel of technology uh, is measuring the fractional um, change in the length of the arms, four kilometer long arms of an interferometer and the fractional delta L over L variation of the length of this interferometer for here the first event on 14 September 2015 are shown here. This is the Hanford data and the Livingston data in red and in blue. And if you can see the scale, actually the scale is that, so you might think naively that this is the gravitational wave, but because it oscillates, 
But if you look at the scale, the scale of variation, fractional variation of the arms of the interferometer is 10 to the minus 18, while the real gravitational wave is actually of amplitude 10 to the minus 21. Uh, and here is a theoretically computed waveform, which is hidden somewhere there. So the first point to realize, and this applies to all LIGO data, is when an interferometer measures really uh, um, the signal in real time, because of the broadband noise, the gravitational wave signal is lost by a factor 1000 in the middle of broadband noise. Then, uh, how do you extract the signal? Actually, LIGO and Virgo are using several methods uh, that I will not um, discuss in detail. Probably they will be discussed in other talks. But one of them, uh, some of the methods use less uh, theory information, uh, which is quite useful because if you look for a signal that you don't know in advance, uh, uh, it's good to look for signals by methods that do not pre-assume a signal. But actually, other methods called match filter uh, have to, pre, to use a bank of pre-computed waveforms. And here is an example of a gravitational wave emitted by a coalescing black hole. And I will concentrate on the methods using this knowledge of um, in advance of uh, gravitational waves, but depending on parameters, so you don't know the exact waveform you look for, you have to look for the good parameters by doing a correlation between the noisy output of the detectors and, uh, and, and the computed waveform. So what is our problem? Our problem is that we start from Einstein's equations, which are written here, uh, in symbolic form, that is to say, with the Einstein tensor on the left and the stress energy tensor of matter on the right. When discussing black hole coalescence, which is a uh, sketch here, actually you don't have matter, so Einstein equation reduced to Ricci equals zero. And here I have written for you explicitly Einstein's equation in a certain so-called harmonic gauge. So you see Einstein equations have uh, a certain amount of non-linearity. Okay? This is not a linear equation, and you need to solve these non-linear equations up to the moment where you reach very strong fields near the black holes and when the two black holes coalesce. So how uh, this is, ooh, la, la, so I'm going in the wrong direction uh, because the thing doesn't work completely. Let me remind you very quickly of the basics of gravitational waves. What are we talking about? Uh, what we are talking about was uh, basically understood uh, already by Einstein in 1916 with some um, uh, error, which he corrected in 1918. And what Einstein did was to look for solution of Einstein's equations, of his equations, where uh, actually uh, the metric First, you can reduce the metric of space and time you show to purely a spatial variation, metri variation of the spatial metric, which differs from the Euclidean metric by a small quantity, hij, which is a dimensionless quantity measuring the amplitude of the gravitational wave. Now, Einstein found in 1918 that the uh, amplitude of the gravitational wave, which is a tensor, so something more complicated than a vector, it's like a sum of products of two vectors, can be, uh, contains two independent polarization. And when the wave propagates in the, along the Z axis, let's say if you choose X, Y, Z axis in uh, the nearly flat uh, region where the gravitational wave propagates, you have one component of the wave which is in the x, x or minus y, y direction and another one which is uh, mixed in the off diagonal x, y direction. Okay. What is the effect of the gravitational wave? The effect of a gravitational wave, hij, is directly to, in an effective way, um, fluctuate, make fluctuate the, the length of an interferometer such that the fractional change of each arm, delta L over L, is proportional to the uh, tensor Hij projected 
in the unit vector, which is along the arm for one of the arms. And now what we want is to compute what is the gravitational wave emitted by some type of source, like a binary system or a supernova or whatever. Einstein in 1916-18 uh, provided the first approximation to this, which is that the waveform uh, is proportional to some projection that I will not explain in detail, which projection which makes it uh, only uh, in the plane transverse to the propagation far away of the second derivative of the quadrupole moment of the system. The quadrupole moment of the system is the integral over space of the energy density defined by e equal mc square as the, I mean, the mass density defined as energy density divided by the square of the velocity of light, contracted with two powers of the, the, the vector uh, from the origin of the system you are talking about. And this wave also decreases like the inverse of the distance. Now, I want to pay homage to the person who was the first one to realize that gravitational waves uh, could be important in astrophysics, because as Ray Weiss reminded us of, uh, for many, many years, Einstein and all his followers computed what is the waveform, the amount, the amplitude of the waveform emitted by binary systems they knew of. Like, you know, you can take two stars going around in a, um, a few hours or something like that, you push to the maximum. And when you compute this and, and you know the distance to a star, you find that the, this wave is negligibly small. Totally, it has no effect nearly on the evolution of the system. It does not make any loss of energy and it's too small when it arrives on Earth. But somebody, Freeman Dyson, who is actually, you know, one of the, who died recently, but is one of the great physicists of the 20th century in quantum field theory and in many other activities. And, and Dyson made the following reasoning, which is at the beginning a textbook reasoning, but with a twist at the end. Because in textbooks like Landau Lifshitz, uh, it is said that if you have a binary system, it will emit gravitational waves, and there will be a flux of gravitational wave at infinity as computed by Einstein. This flux means the system is losing energy in angular momentum, and therefore the binding energy of the system E has to decrease uh, exactly to balance the flux of energy at infinity. And, and the flux is extremely small, and therefore you say the change of energy is negligible. But Dyson understood that if you wait long enough, if you wait for hundreds of millions of years, the, the, the thing will make like will accelerate, will make a snowball because the, the two cis, the two bodies will get closer because they, they lose energy and therefore they will emit more energy. But if they emit more energy, they get closer and closer, faster and faster. And at the end, in the last fraction of a second, Freeman Dyson said explicitly that this will produce an intense flash of gravitational waves. Uh, emitted during the last orbit and even estimated the order of magnitude and realized this was a huge energy and that these waves might be intense enough to be detected by detectors, okay? So Dyson really had this vision, but also Dyson left us with a challenge because uh, Dyson was estimating the gravitational waves by a formula derived by Einstein, but the formula derived by Einstein is valid only when the two bodies move very slowly and emit very little gravitational waves. At the end, when the two bodies nearly coalesce because they got so close, the interaction between the two bodies becomes extremely strong, nonlinear effects become important, and relativistic effects uh, become very important. The two bodies move like at half the velocity of light. So the challenge was uh, for theorists to set up uh, th um, theoretical calculations allowing one to compute the motion and the gravitational waves emitted by two black holes up to the Dyson type coalescence. And this is where I want to guide you through. Many different methods have been combined to do that. 
uh, what are the tools that have been used? The first tool is a tool which had been introduced already in 1912, actually, by uh, Einstein and, and Droster, which is called the post-Newtonian approximation. And I can say immediately that though the post-Newtonian approximation is one of the oldest, it is still quite useful today and maybe for tomorrow. We will discuss this um, at the end. The post-Newtonian approximation is an expansion in inverse velocity of light. It uses the fact that the two bodies move slowly, you assume, compared to the velocity of light. So you have a small parameter V over C, but you have also a small gravitational potential, Gm over C square R, and, uh, and also the uh, retardation effects of the gravitational wave going from one body to the next takes very little time. So you can expand everything in inverse power of C. Now, another approximation also introduced by Einstein, actually, in 1915, is the post-Minkowskian approximation, where you, you don't assume that the velocity of light is, is large, but you make an expansion in the gravitational constant, which means that you assume that the uh, perturbation from Minkowski flat space-time is small, and you look for a solution of Einstein equations in successive powers of Newton's constant g. As we will see, to these basic methods, new methods had to be added. I will explain briefly them. Multipolar post-Minkowskian, to be able to compute the gravitational wave emission, match asymptotic expansion, gravitational self-force, effective one body. And more recently, numerical relativity came into the game and was quite important to, uh, to combine and improve all previous methods. And very recently, I will at the end give you a flavor of this, New methods are being um, developed, effective field theory, quantum scattering amplitude, or classical, and the tutti frutti method. That will be for the end, if we still have time. Now, very briefly, I want to give you also a flavor of the problem of motion in general relativity. We are talking about the motion of two bodies, which are interacting by gravity. The, the first um, method towards doing this was introduced again by Einstein very early on, which was to say that if you have a body which has a much smaller mass than the bodies around itself, you can say that it follows a geodesic in the curved space-time created by the other bodies. But this is not enough, this idea, if you have two bodies of comparable masses, because in that case you need to solve Einstein equations by successive approximations, as I explained, like the curved space-time metric G mu nu is the Minkowski et al mu nu plus something small, and then you use the one over the smallness of uh, one over C factor with the post-Newton approximation. This this approach to the problem of motion was discussed at length and worked out by many people, uh, and in particular. This is the last works of Levi Civita in, uh, in a book published uh, by Levi Civita after his death, actually. Uh, but for many years, people discussed this method uh, for extended bodies, like they had in mind, you know, the planet or the, the sun, which had uh, a weak self-gravity. Also, there was a problem in 1970s when people like Chandrasekhar in particular tried to push this post-Newton approximation to higher order, they ran into problem. Infinite integrals appeared. I will explain how to cure this problem, but first let me explain the basic uh, structure of black holes, because we are going to discuss the coalescence and binary system made of two black holes. So what is a black hole? Uh, Actually, uh, a few weeks after Einstein wrote his equation, his colleague, Karl Schwarzschild, who was actually, this was the war, he was on the East Front in the German army, had the time to compute the first exact solution of Einstein equation, which is this one, now called the Schwarzschild solution, and now called the Schwarzschild black hole, except that at the time, Schwarzschild understood this was an interesting solution, but he did not say this is a black hole. It took many years. So let's let's have a quick look at this solution. What is quite important in this solution is the coefficient of the dt square, that is to say the modification of the 
of the proper time that you measure at some location are compared to the coordinate time at infinity is given by this factor, uh, 1 minus 2 gm over c square r. This factor will play an important role in the following. You can view this factor as being essentially the gravitational potential because you recognize the Newtonian potential, gm over c square r, but here it, it is combined with a factor 2 and a coefficient 1 in front. Uh, but this is an important element of the Schwarzschild metric, which expresses uh, the gravitational attraction okay, of this uh, solution. Now, the person who really invented the concept of black hole was Oppenheimer and his uh, co young collaborator Snyder in 1939, where he understood that um, if a neutron star exceeds the maximum mass that it can hold, it will uh, undergo a continued collapse, how it was called at the time, and uh, will leave outside by some uh, geometrical structure that was understood only much later by the Russian school and by Roger Penrose. I will not enter into the definition really of the horizon of a black hole, but uh, the idea is that um, a star can collapse and, and leaves uh, no matter uh, in sight, but a certain uh, geometrical structure of space and time. Okay. Now, how can we discuss the motion of two black holes? Black holes are really the strongest gravity, self-gravity objects you can think of, or also neutron stars have a very strong gravity. So you cannot use an approximation method which assumes that the, the metric is a very small deviation of flat space-time because if you sit on a neutron star or on the horizon of a black hole, the deviation is 100%. So you cannot assume that you have a small parameter because you don't. So you need to use a special method which, in a sense, was first envisioned by Einstein in field of man, of man in 1938 and then by other people whose names uh, appear here. I will not enter in the detail of this method, but just to say that uh, you need to combine, okay, so in space-time, you need to distinguish a region far away from the two objects where the gravitational field is strong, is weak, and then a region uh, where the gravitational field is very strong. But this is actually complicated to solve Einstein equation with this double dual structure. And a very convenient method, which was actually first introduced technically by Matheson in 1931 and then in Feld, is to say, if I look at two black holes or two neutron stars from far away, I can approximate them as point masses and then try to describe the distribution of energy and momentum representing these objects by word lines you know, really point mass moving in space-time. Although this poses many technical problems that I will not discuss here, now they are technically understood. So what you do is you solve Einstein equations, uh, and an explicit form of Einstein equation is, is like that, where on the left-hand side, you have like the d'Alembert operator acting on the modification of the metric, you have the stress energy tensor along two word lines of two point masses, and then you have many nonlinear terms. Here I have written the first nonlinear term that you need to take into account to solve Einstein equation step by step. So when you do that, yes, so uh, what I wanted to say is like in the 70s, people realized that if you use the post Newtonian approximation, as the post Newtonian approximation assumes that the retardation effects are, um, are negligible or that you can expand in them, a consequence is that this approximation is valid only in the near zone near the system, but not in the wave zone. And therefore, it has difficulties taking into account radiation reaction effects. And after the discovery of the binary pulsar, several groups uh, embark on uh, using the post Minkowskian approximation method, where you have two black holes represented at two word lines, and then they interact via 
the retarded propagator because when you solve Einstein equations, you have to solve d'Alembert of some metric perturbation equals something in the right hand side, and then you need to solve. So you need to solve a d'Alembert equation by retarded propagators, but you need to take into account nonlinear effects. So you have something you can describe this way, which says that the nonlinear effects created by the second mass M2 combine in somewhere in space and time and re-emit some secondary gravitational wave on the first object. And, and this, this was done at some level of approximation, uh, which uh, essentially corresponds to two loop uh, in the 1980s. And at the end, you get equations of motion for each word line, which are Poincaré invariant. You know, they have the nice Lorentz invariant. But if you want to see better what physics they contain, you can expand these equations of motion in one over C. That is to say, you can expand by saying the all retardation effects coming from the other body in the final equation of motion, you can expand. This is allowed. And when you do that, you get these explicit equations of motion computed up to the fifth order in V over C. The lowest order is the Newtonian acceleration. You can recognize minus GM2 over R square acting on the first body, the acceleration of body one. Then you have uh, V square over C square and, and, uh, and GM over C square are corrections to the Newton acceleration here. Then you have terms of one over C4 here, which are more complicated, and one over C5, and you find that this contains radiation reactions. So at this level, you have confirmed that the two bodies, indeed, there is a radiation reaction, and the two bodies will lose energy and angular momentum due to the retarded gravitational interaction. But what was also realized at the time is when you solve Einstein equation by this post-Minkowskian successive approximation, this is conceptually good, but this is technically complicated because you need to compute very complicated integrals. You know, This diagram means that you solve by perturbation theory Einstein equation, but at the end, you have to combine integrals over space as time with retarded propagators. And the question is, can you compute these integrals? And actually, it's quite difficult to compute these integrals. And when people said, for LIGO-Virgo purposes, it will be good to go beyond the approximation which was obtained in the 1980s, that is to say, beyond the V5 over C5 approximation, People started saying, maybe we should, now that we understand better why the naive post-Newtonian calculation did not work well, maybe we can reuse the post-Newtonian approximation. And instead of working with the inverse um, d'Alembert operator, which is uh, this uh, operator here symbolically, expand it in powers of 1 over C, uh, which uh, has the advantage of reducing um, the first term, for instance, to a one over R potential. So when you do that, you have um, more terms to compute, but each term is simpler because it says that the two bodies interact even via nonlinear effects by one over R potential. And then the idea was to say, and then we will add radiation reaction uh, separately by assuming that the energy emitted at infinity has to be paid by the system. So. This is what allowed, um, and, and this took many years, to compute explicitly the equations of motion post-Newtonian expanded up to the V8 over C8 approximation, so-called fourth post-Newtonian approximation. And uh, uh, a surprise that I will discuss in a moment is the interaction becomes non-local in time. What I want to emphasize also that uh, let me show you very briefly these equations. So what you get is for the conservative part of the dynamics, you get an Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian is written as the sum of the Newtonian Hamiltonian. Here you recognize, you know, P squared over 2M for each body and the, the Newtonian potential here uh, with a minus one half because you add also the other, the contribution of the other body. So this is the Newtonian approximation to the dynamics of two bodies. The V square over C square correction is here. The V4 over C4 correction is here. 
and the V6 over C6 correction takes a full page, and the V8 over C8 can be put on a full page if you make it very small, like here, and also contains a term which is an integral of over the infinite past and also infinite future, a non-local interaction. Okay, so what I wanted um, to allude to is that also very quickly is that here I have shown the Hamiltonian for two non-spinning bodies, but all this work was extended to include the effect of the two spins. Each body can be a spinning object. A neutron star can spin, a black hole can spin, it's a curved solution. And then for uh, LIGO-Virgo purposes, it is quite important to take into account spin effects. And these have been computed by many people up to uh, high accuracy too. Now, I have described here very quickly how one could compute the conservative part of the of the dynamics of the Hamiltonian. But now one needs to compute how much gravitational radiation is emitted by the system to compute the reaction uh, due to the losses of energy and angular momentum. How was it done? So, as I already said, the, the pioneer evidently <laughs> was Einstein, who had written what I wrote before, the quadrupole formula. So Einstein said, OK, let's compute to the absolute lowest approximation what is the emission of gravitational waves. And he found it was the quadrupole, which is most important, and the second derivative of the quadrupole. Evidently, you could, um, everybody uh, knew that if you want to improve the accuracy, you need to include not only the quadrupole, but to go beyond the quadrupole. And then to uh, include octupole, and actually, as we will see, there are several types of multipoles. So you need to take uh, an, a large number of multipolar effects. But more importantly, as Einstein equations, as I have reminded you, are nonlinear, you, you cannot use simply linear approximation to compute the emission of gravitational wave by two moving bodies. You need to take into account all the nonlinearities of the gravitational field. And several methods have been introduced by Bonnor, Rothenberg, Epstein, Wagner, Will, Thorne. And then we combine the best of these methods with uh, Luc Blanchet and Bala Ayer to come up with uh, a new formalism called multipolar post Minkowskian formalism. I will just, in one transparency, give you an idea of this formalism. This formalism is uh, is efficient in the sense that it allows to compute to very high accuracy, which is needed the gravitational wave emission by binary system. And it does so by combining different approximations. Because as I very briefly said, the problem of the post-Newtonian approximation is valid only in the near zone. This is, by the way, a space-time diagram with two bodies moving around each other in space-time, like a DNA molecule. And the post newton approximation is valid only in the near zone of the system. Why? Uh, so the idea of the multipolar post Minkowskian is to combine two approximation methods, one in the near zone, post Newtonian, and one in the uh, external zone, which is uh, larger than the wave zone, which is post Minkowskian, which means you expand uh, the metric in first order in Newton's constant, second order, third order. But then each order you expand in multiples, an infinite number of multiples, uh, the quadrupole, the octupole, and, and what is what was found is that there are two types of multiples, multiples of the usual quadrupole type linked to the mass density and multiples linked to the spin density. Anyway, this method uh, was set up. It took years to compute things. Luc Blanchet uh, played a very important role in um, getting the highest accuracy results. And at the end, you have um, a wide generalization of Einstein's quadrupole formula, because what you derive finally is that if at infinity you look at the wave zone, and if you expand the, if you look, sorry, at the waveform, uh, emitted at some radius r. If you expand this waveform in angular multipoles, it contains a quadrupole, an octupole, etc. And for instance, the quadrupole you would measure in the waveform 
is not simply equal to the second time derivative of the quadrupole of the source. It is equal to the second time derivative of a quantity, which, let's say M, which itself is computed as another quantity I, and this quantity I with two indices is obtained as an integral over the source, which is more complicated than the quadrupole, you see, it is the relativistic quadrupole, which contains several terms, and hidden in this object, you have something which replaces the mass density that appeared in Einstein quadrupole formula, but this mass density contains nonlinear effects. In addition to the nonlinear effects contained in this source type multiples, you also have other nonlinear effects which are called tail memory, instantaneous tail of tail. And what is important is the second term here is saying, for instance, that the, the waveform computed at some uh, position far away in space and time is not simply equal to some quantity linked to the source at the retarded time, but it contains an integral over the infinite past. So it is a hereditary contribution. The past of the system also contributes to emitting the, the gravitational wave. At the end, this allows to compute the uh, gravitational wave flux uh, emitted by a binary system, especially if the calculation is simpler if you concentrate on circular orbits, which are most important in first approximation. And here I wrote the state of the art, which is the gravitational wave flux. The first term, 32 over 5, uh, the square of this quantity, which is the symmetric mass ratio. The symmetric mass ratio for a binary system is the product of the masses divided by the square of the sum. So it appears square, and there is the tenth power of V over C, okay, computed in terms of the orbital frequency of the system. So the first term here is Einstein's quadrupole term. And then you see that the next term is a V square over C square correction, V cube over C cube, V4 over C4, up to V7 over C7. For the moment, uh, one has not yet been able to compute the V8 over C8 uh, term, uh, and that would be important to improve this. So here I have quickly um, summarized the fact that uh, analytical methods have allowed to compute the, the Hamiltonian describing the dynamics of two bodies expanded in powers of V over C, and also the gravitational wave flux also expanded in powers of V over C. And then, uh, as Dyson already uh, understood, um, the problem with this, um, these results is uh, you don't know if they will be valid up to the last orbits because during the last orbits, the two bodies get very close to each other and their velocity divided by the velocity of light is no longer a small parameter. And in the 1990s, um, our American colleagues in the, in the group of, of Keith Thorne uh, alerted everybody on the fact that the, the type of post-Newtonian expansions describing both the dynamics, the flux, and the combination of the two uh, is badly convergent, and they, they, they concluded that they would not be valid to describe the last 10 orbits of in spiral, and therefore they said that the, all the analytical calculation break down uh, 10 orbits before the merger, and after this, you absolutely need numerical relativity to compute maybe a very complicated waveform. Uh, in Europe, we took um, a more optimistic attitude uh, with Ayer Satya Prakash and Alessandra Buonanno. Uh, we said, no, let's try to use better methods that will resum the analytical results and maybe be able to describe the last orbit. And this method is the effective one-body uh, method that I want uh, very briefly to describe uh, mainly in words. So the idea of the effective one-body method is to be optimistic, let us say, but to use all the existing um, theoretical knowledge that we add about, uh, about um, gravitational interacting systems. So the idea is we take the post-Newtonian results, which are expanded in powers of V over C. It is true that this expansion becomes bad at the end, but we are going to 
uh, improve the convergence and be able to push the accuracy of the post newtonian results up to really the merger. And then after the merger, thanks to the basic discovery of Vishveshvara in 1970, Davis Ruffini, Tiomno, uh, people had understood that when the two black holes coalesce, they will emit um, the quasi-normal modes, which are like vibration modes of the final black hole, which is formed by the coalescence of two black holes. And then the idea was to uh, push the accuracy of the post-Newtonian waveform up to the merger, and after the merger, add to complete the waveform and describe the full uh, thing, uh, uh, sum of quasi-normal modes representing the ring down, okay, of the two, of the coalescing, the form, the newly formed black hole. So, very briefly, the in a cartoon manner, the um, this method is called effective one body for the following reason. We have seen before, like the Hamiltonian describing, and let me show it to you again. Uh, where is it? It's here. Yes. We had seen that the Hamiltonian describing here at the third post-Newtonian approximation is given by a complicated sum of terms uh, of correction. So this is an Hamiltonian describing the interaction of two bodies of mass M1 and M2. And the idea was to say, uh, let's transform this information by keeping all this information, but represent it in a different way as the motion of a particle of mass mu where mu is the usual effective mass of Newtonian theory, m1, m2 divided by the sum of the two masses, moving in some unknown external geometry, an effective metric g mu nu, such that this effective geometry, which does not represent the real geometry of space-time, the, that the geodesic motion of a particle of mass mu and with spin degrees of freedom in some effective metric is equivalent to the complicated Hamiltonian. And at this stage, you realize that it simplifies the problem because as the interaction of two bodies, though it is very complicated, has no preferred direction in space, if there is an effective metric, it must be spherically symmetric. And being spherically symmetric, you can write it exactly like the Schwarzschild black hole, with r square d theta square and sine square d theta square phi square for the angular variables, and just two functions a and b describing the modification of the time aspect and the radial aspect. Okay, in the Schwarzschild case, the a function was one minus two gm over c square r, and b was the inverse of this. And the idea is, do there exist functions? for a comparable mass binary system that represent all the information given in the post-Newton expanded way. And we, we found, first with Bonanno and then with Jaranowski and Schaeffer, that it is possible. And, uh, but in doing so, you, uh, you are going to have a, a better description, which allows to describe the last orbits. At the end, you find that the Hamiltonian describing the real energy of the system is given essentially by the square root of something which contains another Hamiltonian, which is the Hamiltonian describing the conserved energy of a particle moving in, in some metric, effective metric with some uh, Finslerian terms. And the beauty of this approach is that the effective metric at the third post-Newtonian approximation is given by this quite simple formula. If you remember that the full third post-Newtonian dynamics is represented by this, all the information contained here is actually encoded in these three simple function. The function A, uh, D bar, which is the product of A and B uh, inverse, and a function Q, which is quartic in the momenta uh, appearing here. Let's concentrate on the function a. I, I emphasized before that in the Schwarzschild metric, the coefficient of dt square is essentially uh, a souvenir of the uh, Newtonian potential. You know, it was one minus two gm over c square r. It is the quantity which measures really the gravitational attraction 
of the Schwarzschild black hole. But here, we have this effective metric describes the interaction of two black holes, and the coefficient a is no longer equal to 1 minus 2 gm over c square r, let's denote it by u, but 1 minus 2u plus a correction of order u cube. There is no correction of order u square after consideration, which is proportional to the symmetric mass ratio, m1, m2 over the square of the mass, which means for a test particle, m1, m2 over m1 plus m2 square is negligible, and then nu is zero and nu is zero here. So you recover the Schwarzschild metric, but when you don't have a Schwarzschild metric, when you have two bodies of comparable mass, you have this extra term and this extra term. But you see that this thing uh, allows to uh, describe complicated dynamics in a very compact way. I should say that evidently this thing was also done for spin effects. Spin effects are more complicated to take into account, but still much simpler when you do it in this effective one body way. I have just sketched here that you need to add in the Hamiltonian spin dependent terms. Uh, let me um, also say, so here I was saying uh, the first element of the effective one body approach is to say, uh, let's improve the description of the dynamics of two bodies by representing the Hamiltonian in this effective one body uh, way. But now we still need to add to the conservative equations of motion, Hamilton's equations, uh, uh, radiation reaction force, which takes into account the loss of energy and angular momentum via gravitational waves, and uh, prominently you need to compute the gravitational wave itself. And this is here that another resummation uh, approach was uh, uh, concocted at the time, where the, the waveform at infinity was decomposed in multipoles, LM first, because it is convenient not to use tensors, but multipole. Uh, and each multipole was decomposed in a product of terms. And some of these terms were uh, computed exactly. For instance, tail effects are, uh, are computed in terms of these gamma function and exponential things. So instead of having complicated integral and many terms, you exponentiate everything in this form. And uh, part of the terms are put also in a special way, which means that you use the post-Newtonian information for the waveform and the, the flux, but you put it in a more compact form. And then it was shown that this is actually, uh, it agrees very well with um, with the like numerical relativity estimate. So let me show the final result. The final result of this effective one body method is the following. You have equations of motion written explicitly here, which are like Hamilton's equation, you know, plus a radiation reaction force, which is the loss of angular momentum. How do you compute this uh, radiation reaction force? You compute it by uh, computing the, the flux emitted by the sum over all the multipoles, and then each multipole is written explicitly in an analytic form. So it is a completely analytical way of describing the, uh, the dynamics of two bodies, uh, the waveform emitted, and the radiation reaction. And then you can solve it uh, simply using, you know, uh, ODEs uh, with Mathematica. It, it takes uh, like 30 seconds if you want to do it for a long time. And here, you see the relative motion of the two bodies, they go around each other. And then here you see the waveform emitted, computed by the same method. And when you arrive at a certain moment, the method itself tells you, ah, at this point, you need to replace the two bodies by a merger uh, of the two black holes and by the ring down of the final oscillation of this. And you, the method computes also for you what is the ring down. So it computes complete waveforms for binary black hole coalescences, uh, including the in spiral, last orbits, merger, and ring down. Uh, before maybe um, a short break, let me, um, or should I take a short break now? You know, chance, so, uh, no, I continue. So here I have this. Probably if you just complete the yes. whole, yeah. Yes. Okay, let me complete this. So this was, uh, so I have quickly described here 
uh, how purely analytical methods uh, led in, in 2000 to the computation of the waveforms. Then numerical relativity came into the game because numerical relativity, uh, first, uh, you have to realize that uh, physics in general has a long time scale and it is also based on mathematics like Einstein understood for general relativity. Also, the mathematical, the mathematical foundations for numerical relativity were uh, laid down by Darmois, Choquet-Bruin, others. And uh, it took many, many years. Actually, the first attempts to compute numerically the coalescence of two black holes was in the 1970s and 80s. And it's only after 30 years of uh, computer development and uh, conceptual development on how to write Einstein equations in the best way that the breakthrough came in 2005 uh, by Pretorius and then other people followed immediately. So Pretorius was the first one to compute the coalescence of two black holes. And uh, remember, so this was in 2005. So when the effective one body method was developed around 2000, there did not exist any um, numerical waveform and there was this estimate of what would be the waveform. So uh, quickly, um, in particular in the work of Buonanno, Cook and Pretorius, uh, one could compare the waveform computed purely analytically by the effective one body method uh, and the numerical one. And this is the comparison of the phase, evol the frequency evolution. And here it is the direct comparison of the waveform. And, uh, and, and then what one noticed is that roughly speaking, the effective one body was capturing uh, all the physics of the merger, uh, except that the ring down here was not very accurate. Uh, but there was not something very complicated happening at merger. And, and later, the basic idea was to say, can one use now the new information containing numerical relativity to improve the effective one body analytical method? And this is what was developed in particular in collaboration with uh, several Italian colleagues like Alessandro Nagar, Luciano Rezzolla. Uh, and then over the years, uh, now I should say that uh, recently, now, uh, so, so here I'm saying the first numerical relativity uh, waveforms were computed in 2005. Uh, then over the years, um, in particular, the uh, simulating extreme space-time SXS collaboration succeeded in uh, computing very accurate waveforms. And in 2013, they computed like several hundred waveforms. And in the latest uh, release of their catalog in 2019, they showed how to compute more than 2,000 waveforms. So here is a sample of the waveforms by numerically solving Einstein equations. And evidently, numerical waveforms uh, play a crucial role for an accurate description of the merger and also of what happens when you have very large spin near the curl limit. But numerical waveforms also have their limitations. Like for instance, it is very timely, it takes a lot of time, very time consuming to compute more, you know, than 10 orbits or something like that. They succeeded sometimes in computing uh, 100 orbits, but it takes uh, months. Uh, and also they cannot cover very uniformly the parameter space. So essentially, uh, numerical relativity is important, but analytical methods keep completely their importance. And uh, one of the best thing we have today is to combine, to have the best of two worlds. That is to say, one uses all the analytical information, one injects new information obtained by a certain number of numerical relativity simulation. And I will describe one way to, in particular, uh, there are several ways, I will come back to it, to use numerical relativity information. Uh, but let me describe, to be concrete, one way in which the effective one body um, description can be improved by numerical relativity information. As I said before, what is very important in the effective one body description of the interaction of two bodies is the function A 
which is G00, which is the coefficient of dt square in the effective metric. This function, I said, has been computed analytically at the 4pn approximation, and, and this is the result here. It is 1 minus 2u, uh, 2 nu u cube, which is uh, uh, 2pn, this is uh, 3pn, and this is the 4pn term. So all this has been computed analytically. At the next order, only the log of u term u6 has been computed, but the coefficient, we know from the effective one body metric that there should be a coefficient here which uh, does not contain log of u, but which is um, a function of nu. So, but in, we cannot compute it today, although there has been recent progress that nearly got there recently. Uh, but what one can do is to say, okay, let's assume that there exists a number and let's compare the predictions of effective one body theory to a sample of numerical relativity simulation and calibrate, that is to say, fit a value of this unknown quantity such that the numerical relativity data are well explained. And this is the, the result you get. And uh, let me uh, actually emphasize that when you do that, so you get uh, a potential, which is essentially the gravitational attraction potential of two black holes of comparable mass, let's say in the equal mass case, which is described either by the uh, so it's called EOB NR, which means combining EOB and analytical and numerical activity. And here there are several curves. There exists a blue curve, sorry, the blue curve is here and the red curve is here. The blue curve and the red curve, they coincide very closely here and they were obtained by using numerical activity data by two groups, our group and the group of Alessandra Buonanno. Uh, but you see numerical relativity says this uh, gravitational potential should be here. But if you ask, but where was the approximation to this potential already computed by the 3PN approximation in 2000? Actually, it was, you know, not very far. It is the green curve. And the Schwarzschild uh, answer is here. The Schwarzschild answer is definitely bad does not describe the interaction of two comparable mass black hole, but you see that analytical information was already close to the good answer, but numerical relativity is very important to go the last step. And at the end, just to give you a, a sample of results, uh, you improve the effective one body uh, analytical description. It's, it remains purely analytical, you know, because once you have fitted this A6 coefficient, you put it in the Hamiltonian, which is purely analytical, and then you integrate the equations, and then you improve also some parameters in the waveform. So when you do that, you can compute a complete EOBNR waveform emitted by the coalescence of two black holes, and you can compare it to a purely numerical relativity waveform. And on this graph, you see two curves, or maybe you don't even see there are two curves, because actually there is a red curve, and a black curve. But if you look here, the difference between the black curve and the red curve, the, the black curve is the numerical relativity waveform, the red curve is a EOB NR waveform. And they essentially coincide to very high accuracy everywhere, you know, during the in-spiral, last orbit, merger, and ring down, except just after merger, a little bit different, but which is actually negligible for purposes. So it is remarkable that I, I still think maybe we were very lucky, I don't know, uh, but that an analytical approximation pushing post-Newtonian approximation using some NR information to improve what happens at merger is able to describe uh, the full waveform emitted by such a complicated uh, space-time as the merging of two black holes. So it shows that there is some simplicity in the space-time of two black holes. It looks something very complicated, and it is very complicated, but finally, for the description of the, the waveform, you can use analytical information um, to um, very good uh, effect. At the end, so, so here it uh, explains what I said at the beginning. I said the idea of the, uh, of the analytical approach is to be able to compute waveforms in advance so that you compute a bank of pre-computed waveforms, 
you know, waveforms of this type, but for all possible mass ratio, all possible masses, and then you add spins, and now you want to add also some eccentricity in the system. These waveforms were computed. There were hundreds of thousands of so-called waveform templates computed and used in, in the in the first observing sessions, 01, 02, and now 03, together, I should say, with other uh, ways of doing uh, waveforms called phenomenological, but which actually also use um, the effective uh, one body. So uh, what I want to emphasize here, and you tell me if I should, when I should stop, is uh, there exists a very uh, healthy, uh, interaction between uh, numerical relativity and analytical methods. Uh, it will remain for the future very important to have analytical information because, for instance, when numerical relativity tried to simulate uh, the full length of the waveform for the event gravitational wave 15, 12, 26, it took three months and 70,000 of CPU hours just to do the simulation. Why, if you do it analytically, it takes uh, 30 seconds to compute the, the waveform. I should say also that now that numerical relativity is able to produce more and more waveforms, uh, people start developing other ways, still using analytical information, but of doing so-called surrogate frequency domain uh, waveforms. Okay? Should I, uh, and at the end, uh, at the end for this part, because um, if you want a, a break, we could have a short break now. I will not discuss this, but just to remind you, this will be discussed by others. LIGO and Virgo have discovered many coalescences of black hole and uh, two very important events that involve probably two neutron stars, have done tests of generativity, etc., etc. Should I? Uh, should we have a, a break in a chance of Yes, I would suggest so. And incidentally, there are a couple of questions on the YouTube channel. One is from uh, Wen Xin, and he asks, in order to test GR, is it necessary to establish the accurate gravitational waveform, such as the, uh, the EOB, in modified gravity? Good question. I yes, let me answer immediately. In principle, yes. If somebody believes really in a, in the theory of gravity, his task should be to compute analytically, to redo all the work that went into GR, okay? But uh, nobody is able to do that, or nobody <laughs> believes enough in an uh, alternative theories are actually more complicated than GR. So either people try to do some numerical so, uh, simulations for alternative theories, or what LIGO Virgo is doing is to use parameterized templates. They use templates like in the frequency domain where you represent the post neutron information by coefficients in an expansion, and then you modify the, co the coefficient. You say, ah, maybe this coefficient could be modified. Let us see if the experimental data confirm the GR value. Okay, but in the future, indeed, one should compute in principle in each different theory of gravity. Okay, thanks. I don't see any other questions on the YouTube channel. And uh, is there anyone in the uh, Teams classroom who wants to ask a question during this break? Please raise your hand if you want to speak. Thibaut, I think that most of the people are scared to make questions. So, <laughs> so. Uh, Probably, again, this is something that I always insist on. Don't be uh, scared by the possibility of making naive questions. Uh, before you understand things fully, all questions are naive, but all questions are valuable. So please ask questions without being shy. OK, so we have Adia Sharma. Adia, please uh, unmute your microphone and ask your question. Hi, hi, Professor. Uh, I, I wanted to ask a very naive question. So uh, you said that EOB and our waveform, and you say EOB and our waveform, those are calibrated, right? Like uh, you, you, so. Uh, EOB and our waveforms are. Yeah, so those have to be calibrated, like, right? Yes. You have, 
so how do you calibrate it and also you mentioned team merger and i saw that team merger was not at the peak of the waveform so it was slightly before the peak of the waveform so how do you quantify that uh, uh, team merger uh, i think in your slide 42 maybe yes so yeah the merger time it occurs before the peak of the waveform you so mean just, uh, the maximum are you saying your your question here uh, first let me answer well, keep your question the second question concerning the 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 calibration uh, i showed only so one there are two two different calibration on the eob hamiltonian the main point to calibrate is this coefficient so here i describe you you put a coefficient you you vary it numerically until you fit the uh, NR waveform and you determine this. Uh, okay, you also uh, we realize that the reason why the uh, waveform was not accu very accurate, the analytical UB waveform was not very accurate at merger was that they were non-circular corrections. You know. Uh, in the last orbit, the two bodies do not stay on a circular orbit, but they also fall a little bit towards each other. They still go around each other, but they have a radial motion. So we, you introduce a factor uh, which takes into account this radial motion with terms that you know uh, parameterize this radial motion, like r dot square, let's say essentially, or pr square, and then you use numerical relativity to fit the coefficient of pr square. This is the way you improve, um, uh, you calibrate. Now, you had a question here about the, the merger, the peak of the waveform also. Yeah. Is yeah. your question that the peak is beyond what I've shown merger time here? Right, yeah, but that is the precisely reason, the question. The reason is, this is, this is the real part. This thing is a cosine. So it is the real part, you know, of uh, um, an amplitude A exponential phase. And actually, the merger is the maximum of the amplitude of the modulus. It's, it's just, you know, uh, an artifact that you think the, the, the maximum of the modulus is here. But the phase is such that you have a zero because of the phase. That's all. But really, the maximum of the modulus is here. OK. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, there is another question on behalf of Professor Olga Sajina. Uh, welcome, Olga. And uh, the question is the following. Uh, compared to the Dyson formula, Newtonian approximation uh, for the chirp signal calculation, what is the difference in the last cycles, both in amplitude and frequency, compared with the exact solution of two merging black holes? How many percent? And Yes, good yeah. question. I, I actually, I, um, I did not put this. I will put the slide uh, for after the break to answer okay. the question technically. OK, the roughly the answer is that it's something like there is a 30 percent difference or, or more. But OK, we will discuss this because it's indeed an important question. OK, thanks. So if there are other questions on YouTube or in the MS Teams, I'm looking whether I see any raised hand, but I don't see any. So, uh, no, Osvaldo Gramacho de Freitas. Go ahead, Osvaldo. Thanks. Uh, hello, Professor. I, I was just uh, um, adding on to Aditya's question about the, the, the calibration of the EOB waveform. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I wanted to ask what kind of function you might use to calibrate this. So in, in the slide, we see it. OK, first make question, functions and whatnot. Ah, yes, first I should emphasize, I, um, I wanted just to give you a flavor, is um, indeed there, is, um, there was, let's say, the, the problem at the beginning uh, if you compute analytically the functions that appear in the OB Hamiltonian, like this function a, 1 minus 2, as a function of u, 1 minus 2u plus 2 nu u cube, etc., and 
uh, if you plot it really as it is computed, you find that this function does this and then goes up. OK, it does not it does not uh, go to zero. It does not have like one minus two U, uh, one minus two M over R, you know, uh, it does not vanish anywhere. It is always positive and go up. So immediately uh, already in 2000, we said, ah, but this is an artifact of the bad post neutron expansion. And what we should do is resum it by a PADE approximant. So this is what appears um, here and here. OK, this object here in front or in this formula here, P13. P13 means PADE. PADE replaces a polynomial. This thing, you know, 1 minus 2U plus UQ plus U4 is a polynomial in U. And the coefficient of U4 is so big that this polynomial does not have a zero. So if you want to, it is well known in physics that if you want to improve uh, a polynomial which uh, which goes bad when the argument u gets large, okay, when u gets of order one half or something like that, you can replace a polynomial by a rational function, that is say, the ratio of two polynomials, and this is called the Paddy approximation. And very early on, we said the best thing is to take a polynomial where the numerator is linear in u, so that this way you are close probably to one minus two u or something like that. And then you put the rest in the denominator. So this is what is done also here. Here you have a Paddy which has a, a numerator which is linear in u and a denominator which is of a, a polynomial of fifth degree in u. Okay. By the way, in Mathematica, if you ask Paddy approximate, you know, one five, it gives you immediately the answer. So this this answers your question of how to parameterize the function a. You parameterize the function a by this Paddy. So now it is a rational function, and this rational function depends on one arbitrary parameter, and then you fit. You, you you compare, you know, for a certain number of numerical simulation, and then you least square fit the what is the best value of A6, and you find there is a good value, okay? And then it works. Now, you do a similar things for the waveform. Uh, you introduce uh, corrections that depend on the square of the radial momenta, and with a certain coefficient, and then you, you fit this coefficient to numerical relativity, and you see if it works or not, and it does work. I hope it answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. OK, so my suggestion is that this is uh, 20 minutes to two, and maybe we can take a further five minutes of rest, also to allow our lecturer to relax for a moment, <laughs> okay. and, then we, and then we can start again. Very good. Five minutes. Okay. In five minutes. Yes. See you in a moment. See you.
Uh, So, Tibo, I was trying to contact you using the chat, but I was not able to use it in, in, uh, in team. Yes, I, I was warned by some colleagues that team has, uh, has problems of stability and uh, it's more complicated than Zoom. Okay. I guess you, you need to use Teams for this. but uh... Yeah, we have an arrangement with Teams, but uh, frankly speaking, my impression is that everything Microsoft is uh, exactly. Is, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, we should not say this, but I hate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I had suggested actually Zoom or another tool that is uh, made by the Cisco company that also works rather well, or even the Google one. But this one, I I use it also for my. Uh, classes, but I uh, always have problems. I don't know why, but uh... <laughs> excellent lecture. I mean, you you were able to uh, squeeze the mathematically hard part of all this in uh, in order to allow the people to follow the line of reasoning. So this is. Very good. You are too kind, you know, James. No, 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 no. It's true. So I have only um, 
a few because now I want to give a flavor, you know, of the more recent thing. So it's good mm -hmm. to stop and I can. Um, so I will also give like a flavor because now it gets even more technical. So it's just to of course. an idea. Yeah. But I will answer uh, the question about the difference with, uh, uh, let's say, Dyson type uh, quadrupole approximation. Yeah, the question made by Sajid. Yeah. Yes. Oh, incidentally, she was mentioning that she co-authored the paper devoted to cosmic string candidate, but I think you remember. <laughs> she was just mentioning that the CSL uh, one object. Are you in Paris at this? Yeah, to the, I mean, um, I mean, uh, my institute is southwest of Paris, so I am at IHES in, uh, you know, it's close to Orsay, uh -huh. if you know Orsay. We are yes. just next yes. door to Orsay, so. Yeah, yeah. Here we are in a park. Uh, That's a beautiful area, incidentally. I remember it. Oh, you have a nice view from your yes. window. Uh, you see, your, so it's a very nice place for working quietly. <laughs> I hope that this uh, set of seminars can be, in a certain sense, a first chapter uh, and hope that it might be possible to organize more seminars, maybe devoted to some more focused or more specific topic in presence, assuming that this plug of the COVID eventually sets us free. And of course, you are cordially invited. I know I can say this also on behalf of Salvatore. Thank you. I keep this in mind. To visit us and yeah, and, and hopefully spend some days in Naples with us. Last time uh, close to Naples, I was invited to a school in uh, Ravello. Very nice place. Yes. And, and, and incidentally, for a classic music lover like you are, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, a place for the soul, in yes. a sense. Yes. Uh, yes. This year, they are having some problem in organizing the concert season because of the pandemic issue. But uh, let's hope they will eventually succeed. How are things going in France as regards this very fearful Delta variant that is apparently uh, resurrecting in the UK and also making giving problems in, in Russia, apparently? Yes, in France it is still uh, at a negligible level. There is only one special place where 30 people got it in Bordeaux or something, I forgot. They have mm -hmm. to understand how it came them. So for the moment, OK, it is not there. But as we know, the exponential can <laughs> start from nearly yeah. zero. So yes, we'll see. It is a mess. I should come to Italy in October for the, I hope to be in presence for uh, mm -hmm. receiving in hands the Galileo Galilei medal in October. Uh -huh. So I will go to Florence. Uh -huh. Well, I. It, it seems that the vaccines are protecting also, at least in part, against the variants. So probably the only real issue is the fraction of people yes. who did not. That in Italy is pretty significant, especially in the uh, elderly uh, category, which is the more exposed. Well, let's hope for the best. Should we start? Should yes. we start over? Yes. Okay. I don't know how to ring a bell in MS Teams, but anyway. So I think we are going to restart. Uh, Professor De Moore is ready to make the second part of his presentation. I hope that the people are connected. Actually, we. 
and it is exactly what we did. So, Professor Demo, please. Okay, let me first answer. There was a question about uh, what are the the differences between, let's say, the quadrupole formula description of what would be um, the evolution of the phase near the merger uh, and the full GR. First, it, it completely depends how you use the quadrupole formula, because, you know, if you use a textbook formula of what the quadrupole formula would predict for the phase of a gravitational wave, you would be off by thousands of cycles or something like that. So totally off. So if we want to be more positive towards the quadrupole formula, you can say, OK, I can do something from the quadrupole formula which is to compute this dimensionless quantity, uh, the, the square of the gravitational wave frequency, circular frequency, omega square, divided by omega dot, the time variation of the circular frequency of the gravitational wave, computed directly from the quadrupole formula and expressed in terms of the frequency itself, omega. So it's one way to use the quadrupole formula which is probably the, the best way for showing that uh, uh, to close us to reality. There are other ways where it would be totally off. Anyway, this quantity is a dimensionless quantity. And what is plotted here is uh, this quantity. It's called Q because it's like the quality factor of the gravitational waves, you know, uh, um, if omega dot is very small, which means you have like a cosine which changes its frequency very slowly, you, you have many cycles before you notice the frequency changes. So this quality factor measures uh, the number of cycles it takes for the dephasing of the gravitational waveform. Now what is plotted here is Q omega minus what would be the Newtonian approximation computed by the quadrupole formula. So if you were using uh, Newtonian, you would get zero, okay? Uh, and now, so the zero would be here in this plot, and um, the curve that you get from post-Newtonian expansion is uh, the best post-Newtonian 3.5 pn is this curve, and and this curve, if you go to low frequency, will tend to zero on the left. Um, but when you use EOB, you get this curve here, uh, which goes EOB here, uh, which goes here, which goes here, which goes here, and um, numerical relativity uh, here computed here. Uh, anyway, now the numerical relativity would coincide with um, EOB uh, everywhere here. So the point is, um, the fact that instead of being at zero, you are at uh, minus 15 or minus 20 when you use uh, PN means uh, at a minimum, you make an error of like uh, uh, 15 gravitational wave cycle, even if you do a fit very locally. OK, so anyway, the conclusion is that it is bad, okay? You really cannot use the Newtonian approximation, except if you want a very rough idea of uh, uh, neglecting, uh, you know, something uh, of other unity. Anyway, I hope it, this has roughly answered the question. In the, the last part, of, the second part of the talk will be briefer because I want to give you a flavor of recent developments. The, the theme of, the, of this lecture is analytical approaches to gravitational uh, interaction and gravitational wave signals. And uh, many different approaches over the years have been developed to deal with the dynamics and gravitational radiation of binary systems. So uh, numerical relativity, uh, cell force is an approximation where you use um, uh, you use a small mass ratio, you assume that one of the two bodies has a much smaller mass than the other one, and then in that case you can use black hole perturbation theory. You know, small mass moving in a black hole perturbs the uh, the metric, a la Red J Wheeler Zerilli. Uh, so you can use this. Uh, I explain briefly multipolar post Minkowskian uh, method, post Newtonian, post Minkowskian, and over the last uh, 
let's say a few years, sometimes uh, more than 10 years, uh, methods coming from quantum field theory have been uh, used and compared um, in their predictions about uh, gravitational wave uh, relevant quantities, something called effective field theory and more uh, string theory, uh, perturbation theory, string theory, and quantum field theory. And um, I want the main, the main point, the main takeaway, take home message I want to say is that at present, none of this method has really changed the game. Like for instance, if today you ask, okay, uh, what is the best thing for having uh, improved waveform for LIGO, it is still to improve the post-Newtonian and MPM and inject it in EOB. Uh, but uh, the dialogue which has recently opened between quantum field theory community, string theory, has been uh, quite important. And I will just give you a flavor of it. First, let me tell you that um, recently with uh, Italian colleagues, we have developed uh, a new uh, approach which we called um, tutti frutti, although I was told uh, this is an expression we use in French for uh, mixing many things together, not in Italian, I think, but anyway, uh, because this method combines uh, in a new way several approximation methods. I will not enter into the details, but I want to uh, emphasize two points. Uh, First, this method really tackles non-local in time interaction. You find that at 4 p.m. and then beyond, like 5 p.m. and 6 p.m., the Hamiltonian, or the action describing the dynamics of two bodies, contain a term which is an integral uh, over the time difference between the, the two bodies, I mean, in the world line, okay? It's a non-local uh, effect that you can compute this non-local part. So we use this non-local interaction that we compute analytically, and then we use Reggie wheeler zerilli black hole perturbation theory, together with um, interesting results obtained by Detweiler and Letiek Blanchet uh, Whiting, which allows in this graph to compute all the black dots. So let me explain briefly this graph. This graph uh, encodes all the terms, I mean, symbolically, the terms in an Hamiltonian. An Hamiltonian, for instance, the Newtonian Hamiltonian is P square over two plus GM over R. So GM over R, you call it U. So the Newtonian Hamiltonian would be, you know, P square plus this term U. At the 1 p.m. approximation, you would have a P4, a P square U, and a U square. So the 1 p.m. approximation would be these black dots here, etc. And um, at the 4 p.m. approximation, which is, has been computed, all the dots are black, and the new result is that we could compute the Hamiltonian beyond the 4 p.m. at 5 by using information uh, of the second line of dots. Here in these vertical columns, there are two dots, and when these dots are black, the second dot, which is black, is computed by self force technology. And this allows, you see, to compute most of the terms that exist at 5 p.m. and 6 p.m. For instance, at 5 p.m., there are only two terms that we could not compute. So we have computed the hundreds of terms that exist in the EOB Hamiltonian at 5 p.m., except for two coefficients. Classical scattering of two black holes means you send two black holes at some finite impact parameter, and then you compute the scattering angle of the outgoing black holes. Can you extract the Hamiltonian directly from the scattering angle? And if in, instead of doing a classical scattering, you do a quantum scattering, which is you compute uh, the so-called quantum amplitude representing this quantum scattering, can you extract the Hamiltonian for this? And then where are the radiation effects uh, in this? So I want to give you a flavor of this. This is a very active topic. And, and somebody where uh, uh, an ambitious uh, young person uh, could uh, find very interesting problem here. Let me describe a few of the results and the basics. Like if I do actually classical gravitational scattering is one aspect of post Minkowski on perturbation theory, because it says when I have two black holes interacting, if I compute 
not uh, the bound state when the two black holes go in circular orbits around each other, but uh, at some impact parameter, what is the scattering angle? Can I compute it? And here I have written for you, if you use Einstein equation, you can write down in one line, actually, it is written here. This is the one line that gives the change of momentum of the first particle interacting gravitationally with the second particle. Here you have the propagator which solve Einstein's equation, you write things in a frequency domain, you get this integral. If you compute this integral, you find that the scattering angle, uh, but for relativistic particles, because here it's post minkowskian so you don't assume that V over C equals small, is small, the two bodies could go to, you know, one half of the velocity of light or 99.999999% of the velocity of light. You want to know what is the scattering angle. And you find that the scattering angle can be expanded in a power series of the uh, inverse uh, relative angular momentum, or essentially this is linked to the impact parameter. So you have a first term in one over angular momentum, which corresponds to the first order in G, because you see this small j, sorry, j. This small j contains one over G in its definition. So if you take the inverse, this is first order in G, second order in G, then uh, third order in G, etc. So classically, uh, this calculation gives immediately what is the first order in G. Now the second order in G had been computed by uh, Kondratin-Westphal in 1985 and is given by this simple formula. And now you can ask, if you compute this, if you compute the scattering angle expanded in inverse angular momentum, relative angular momentum, uh, can I extract from these coefficients, the Hamiltonian. And actually, uh, as has been shown, there is an extremely simple answer. If you know uh, the scattering angle as a function of the energy of the system, angular momentum of the system, and expanded in powers of Newton's constant, you can immediately transcribe it in an effective one-body uh, description with uh, um, uh, a Finslerian correction to the effective metric, you find that the effective metric in post minkowskian is the Schwarzschild metric. So this term, um, you, you know what it should be. And then you have corrections to the Schwarzschild metric, which are encoded now by a function, which is one over R square plus one over R cube, where each coefficient is function of the energy. And these coefficients are immediately obtained by simple formula from the scattering angle. So, so this gives a nice uh, way uh, to transform a classical scattering angle into an EOB Hamiltonian or another Hamiltonian if you prefer. Now, uh, in 2019, uh, Bern, Cheng, Royban, Shen, Solon, and Zeng computed the next order, which had post Minkowskian order, the third order in powers of G of the scattering angle. And they found this formula. There is evidently in the limit where the symmetric mass ratio is zero, you should get the Schwarzschild answer. And the new thing is that you compute, they computed the, the term proportional to nu, which is given by this function here. A polynomial in gamma, gamma is the Lorentz factor of the two word lines. And then this function contains an arc tangent of the relative velocity, okay, or, or, or this function. And what was very surprising, and that led to a, a puzzle, is that this is the scattering angle at order g cube for two massive particles. But now, if you take the limit where the Lorentz factor of the two particles go to infinity and where the masses of the particle go to zero, this should describe uh, if, uh, if physics uh, is to be reasonable, the scattering angle of two massless particles. You know, a massless particle is, obtenu, uh, is obtained by keeping the energy fixed, the momentum fixed, but uh, letting the mass go to zero and the velocity go to the velocity of light. But Amati Ciaffaloni Veneziano in 1990 had computed what was the scattering angle uh, in this case, and they had found a finite answer why if you take this answer, you get a logarithmic divergence. So there was a discrepancy. The finite answer was this, and then this thing. So this, uh, so this led to a lot of recent activity. First, 
several people confirmed that the result of uh, Zeebern uh, was correct. And it is only a few months ago in a combination of works, first in supergravity by Paolo Di Vecchia, Carlo Eisenberg, Rodolfo Russo, and Gabriele Veneziano, then by me in classical gravity, and then this has been confirmed, that the answer to this puzzle has been understood. And it is amusing that, in a sense, we go back to what in the 1980s was the motivation for using post Minkowskian approximation method. Because I had said that in the 1970s, when people use post Newtonian theory, they ran into difficulties because the post Newtonian approximation is valid only in the near zone, not in the wave zone, and so cannot take into account radiation reaction correctly. So the idea at the time was to say, let's use post Minkowskian and retarded propagators, as I said, to compute the interaction of two bodies and radiation reaction was included. And what was now better realized is in the calculation of Zwiebern, when, although it is a quantum calculation, they did it in a way by projecting the answer in a certain way that what they were computing was not the scattering angle that would be realized physically by two bodies emitting gravitational radiation during the uh, impact, during the collision, but in a time symmetric setting, that is to say, the conservative dynamics assumes that you have waves coming from infinity, advanced waves, and then coming out as retarded waves so that this scattering does not lose energy in angular momentum. But when you add the effect of radiation reaction, that is to say, here you compute the scattering of two bodies emitting energy and angular momentum. And what is the effect of this emission of the scattering angle? This has resolved exactly the discrepancy. So this was just to give you uh, a flavor. I, I want to say that the beauty of the, the, the recent work, uh, because now I'm reaching my last slide, so I don't want to hold you more, but just to say something. The, the beauty is we are rediscovered, I mean, you know, Einstein for many years, when he discovered general relativity, was the only one to realize, I mean, to have the vision that the fact that space and time was a dynamical field should tell us something about all the other interactions. And he had a dream that there might be a link between Maxwell theory, which is described by a, a vector, and general relativity described by a, a metric tensor. And he tried some theories on how to connect the metric tensor of general relativity to the Young-Mills type interaction. Now, this has been completely renewed by string theory. In string theory, it was discovered uh, early on, actually, uh, that um, the, uh, the, the so-called graviton vertex, that is to say the way a string emits a graviton, is simply the product of the way a, gra uh, a string emits two photons, okay, or a uh, young mid field. So you make the product of the tensor product of emission of a photon or a young mills um, a gluon uh, times emission of a gluon, and this is identical in some sense to the emission of a graviton. And this is this type of ID that has been then imported from string theory in quantum field theory under the name of double copy by Bern, uh, Carrasco, and uh, Johansson. And it is very beautiful to see that the old dream of Einstein that gravity might be connected to something simpler, to electromagnetism, has now become a technical tool which is really used to simplify the computation because at the quantum level, it is simpler to compute the emission of a gluon than the emission of a graviton. You don't use complicated Feynman diagram. So conceptually, the dream of Einstein has now become a tool. This was the last work I wanted to, to say, to, just to give you a flavor that there are uh, all the time, you know, um, new ideas come and, and this gives new uh, technical ways of computing things. For the moment, uh, they do not, they complement, okay, they do not replace what I have explained today and probably the method I have explained today will remain for a long time the most important thing and will uh, be completed by some information from this new quantum amplitude approach. Um, I just wanted to summarize that 
so analytical approaches to gravitational wave signal have played a crucial role in, in conjunction with numerical relativity for the detection, interpretation, and parameter estimation of coalescing binary systems. Uh, there are uh, new results now coming from new methods, and, and these new methods do not yet revolutionize the thing, but at the conceptual level, it is very important to push them vigorously. And, and finally, if I may so, because Innocenzo uh, kindly uh, put me in the, uh, in the tradition, at least, of Poincaré, I want to cite uh, a phrase of Poincaré, which <laughs> resonates in my mind, because I have spent you know, many years uh, working on the two-body problem in general relativity. But Henri Poincaré, who had worked for many years on trying to solve the n-body problem in Newtonian mechanics, and realized the thing was much more complicated, and he had just touched, you know, the scratch, the surface of the topic, said that there are no solved problems. That is to say, there are no problems which are definitely solved. There are only problems that are more or less solved. And the two-body problem in general relativity is just more or less solved, and we need to continue a new generation. We'll have to find new methods and improve our results. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor De Moore. I think that this has been a very enticing. We are looking for a really, how to say, challenging uh, field where to. We get a lot of inspiration from. Okay, so. Are there any questions on behalf of the people connected on the in this case, please raise your hand or the people uh, listening on YouTube? There is a question by Osvaldo Gramaxo. OK, go ahead, Osvaldo. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the, the effects of spin. Um, I've read, for example, in effective field theories, it's sometimes a problem because um, they're considering point particles, so the Lagrangian has to be completely reformulated to, uh, um, to accommodate for, for the spin. Uh, and I was, I was curious when you talked about the, the tutti frutti approach, um, how that those kinds of uh, different, fundamentally different approaches to, um, to how you might expand the parameter space how they um, how, how you deal with that kind of different approaches between different methods to to join them together in the tutti frutti approach so for the tutti frutti approach we have not yet uh, incorporated spin effects although we did incorporate them uh, in self also we we, uh, we can we did not push the accuracy in this direction this is indeed uh, but let me try to answer um, because indeed there is a, a, a big subtlety concerning, I'm looking for the uh, UB Hamiltonian here. Yes, uh, there are several ways of including spin. Spin, which indeed in one way you say, ah, uh, let's assume that, uh, let me stop this. Uh, if you assume, you know, uh, the bodies are non-spinning and suddenly you say they are spinning, just this word, changes completely the, um, the Hamiltonian structure, because the, the structure of the Hamiltonian and symplectic structure of spinning bodies is, is really is, I mean, much more complicated than the Hamiltonian structure. But there is a simple way. There are several simple ways. And what is used in UB, this is what I want to describe, is actually what is used is to say that the effective Hamiltonian contains a part which uh, looks, let's say, what would be the Hamiltonian of a, of a particle, non-spinning particle around a Kerr black hole. If you look at a Kerr black hole, as you know, the metric of Kerr contains spin square terms. It contains uh, the, the spin parameter A square, A fourth, etc., in an exact formula. And, and this thing is actually modeled on the exact Hamiltonian that you would get from Kerr, except that you put extra term like this term and this function and this function. So the terms that are in even powers of the spin, you can include them in this Hamiltonian. And now the terms that are odd powers of the spin, 
you can take them into account by gyromagnetic ratios, that is to say L dot S couplings. It's like, you know, in at atomic physics, when people take into account spin effects, they say, ah, no problem. There is just an L dot S term in the Hamiltonian. And in front of this L dot S, there is a certain uh, function of R of the radius. And this is exactly what you can do in UB. So from the practical point of view, once you have decided that the spins are the spins in the rest frame, you can just write all possible terms and and you get uh, and then you can uh, do a computation yes the maybe the the best answer is the following in order to do things you need to uh, always compute gauge invariant quantities if you compute in any method a quantity which is a gauge invariant observable then you can transcribe it within any other method like this is the case, for instance, of the scattering angle. The scattering angle is completely different from an Hamiltonian, but because it is a gauge invariant quantity, you know in advance that there should be a way to replace it by some term in the Hamiltonian, the potential. And then once you have the idea, it is easy to do it. And the same thing is true for spin. So always work with gauge invariant quantities, and then there is no problem. I see. Thank you. Any other question? Um, I see again a raised end on behalf of Osvaldo, but probably it's just a remnant. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot. I forgot. I forgot. Yeah, OK. And uh, no, I don't see any other question. So. I have only there is there is no. someone on the on YouTube. Yes, I don't have it. Why? No, I think it was a question. I don't think there is anybody for now on YouTube. Okay. No other questions. Um, okay, I would like again to thank Professor Demur. Incidentally, I am thinking with Salvatore about the possibility of collecting all the presentations made by our lecturer <clears throat> in a kind of book. Yes, yes, it could be. Of the SSM, yeah. And I think that uh, probably we should start uh, thinking about that and asking our lecturers to think about the possibility of writing something for <laughs> this kind of <laughs> <laughs> if you want to just to use okay. slides that's okay but uh, to write oh, that i will be easy <laughs> <laughs> okay i think that uh, e oops to put together Sorry. and to leave yeah yeah okay the uh thanks again to professor de moore it has been a real Uh, welcome him in this uh, set of lectures. The next speaker will be Professor Neil Cornish, who will lecture on the methods that are presently used to dig out the signals from noise, both for the case where the signals are known or almost known in advance, and for the case where they are only loosely specified. And the next next will be Professor Vietchan, who will speak about the quantum limits on uh, X3. In uh, gravitational wave detectors. And finally, there will be Stefano Vitale, who will speak about the LISA pathfinder. OK, I yeah. think that if. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, <laughs> just to say bye bye to everyone. Thank you for. Thank you. Thank you, Thibault. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you again. You. Sorry. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you, Professor. Okay. Ciao. Goodbye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Okay. So uh, I think that we can say goodbye to all the other people who attended the lecture and um, see you in one day, basically, the day after tomorrow. Okay. 
Okay. Bye, everybody. See you. Bye.